Hello, everybody. I'm Happy Caldwell, and thank you for joining me for today's edition of Arkansas Alive. All this week, we're talking about the indestructible church. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So if you've been discouraged or anxious or worried, don't be. Jesus is taking care of his church. It's indestructible. Stay tuned. Arkansas Live starts right now. Let's go back to the um, text that we've been uh, teaching from in Matthew 16 and verse 13. Jesus asked Peter, who do men say that I am? And uh, there were different responses. Then Jesus said to Peter, well, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, upon that revelation of who I am, I will build my church. Every born again person that is born into the body of Christ is born into the body of Christ because they have that revelation. I'm not talking about church membership. I'm talking about being born again. And they're born again because of that declaration, that acknowledgement, that revelation of who Jesus is. Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of the living God. He's Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the soon coming king. Once you get this revelation, and you can't get it from men, it has to come from God. It has to come in your heart. And all of a sudden, you realize who Jesus is. The first song I ever wrote when we first started recording uh, as a family uh, back in 73, 74, I used to write a lot of the songs that are on our albums. And the first one that I wrote was The Pain He Suffered Was Real. And I got a revelation of Jesus' crucifixion uh, when he was striped, when he was whipped. It, it so impacted me that I wrote a song about it, and we sang it as on our first album. And we, no, I think we just left it on one. We didn't repeat it on another album. But I realized the pain that Jesus suffered was real. I mean, when they striped him with that cat of nine tails and every six to eight inches woven in there with bone and flint, and it cut his back, it opened him up. <clears throat> the Bible says he didn't even look like a man. When I realized that, 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 that touched me deeply. It, it, Jesus didn't just go to the cross and, you know, say, okay, I'm obeying God. No, Jesus became sin, the Bible says, so we could become right with God, righteous. And when I realized that's what Jesus did for us, wow, that makes all the difference. So you don't you just join a church because if it's of your persuasion, your denomination, you like where it's located, you like the pastor, the, the, the nursery's nice. You don't, you're not shopping. <clears throat> the Bible says God places us in the body where he wants us. So you're placed there for a reason, for a purpose. And the way you get into the church is by being born again. And Jesus told Peter, upon this recognition, a recognition but upon this revelation of who I am, I will build my church. So the church company, the body of Christ, is indestructible. Jesus is building it. You're not. You're not building the church. Uh, contractors are not building the church building. Jesus is building the church body. And then he goes on and he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, that word hell is signified in the marginal reference as Hades. The gates of hell, the authorities of hell itself will not prevail against the church. And yesterday we read out of Ephesians and Luke uh, where principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, wicked spirits are all assailing the church. They're, they're all trying to destroy the church, but they can't. The church cannot be destroyed. The church is indestructible. So if you're a part of the church, if you're a member of the church, if you are the church, if you're the body of Christ, Satan cannot steal, kill, and destroy you. He goes on and says, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and 
Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now we're going to get to that. But right now I want to, I want to spend a little more time on the gates of hell, the authorities of hell, demon powers. Uh, Jesus said in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. When it says they shall not prevail, here, here's what the word prevail means. They shall not triumph. They shall not gain ascendancy through strength or superiority. The gates of hell, the powers, the authorities of hell, they will not triumph. They will not gain ascendancy through strength or superiority. Satan is not stronger than God. In fact, he's not stronger than you. You're the body of Christ. You have the power and authority through Jesus' words in Luke 10, 19. He gave you power and authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. <laughs> I like the way one, one, one Christian said Satan was just really challenging them and trying to steal, kill, and destroy. And <laughs> they just got a revelation of who they were in Christ and, and said, no, 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 you can't do that to me. You can't put that on me. And he heard, he heard a little demon say, I can't. No, you can't. No, you cannot put that on me. No, you cannot do that to me. No, you're not going to steal, kill, and destroy. You have the authority and the power. It says the gates of hell, the authorities of hell cannot, will not, shall not uh, prevail against you. You're the church. You're the body of Christ. So uh, to prevail means to triumph gain ascendancy through strength or superiority. Let's go over to Romans chapter 8. And let's read, uh, oh, let's read several verses. Let's start at verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Mm. So strong. Who shall lay anything at the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died. Yea, rather that's risen again, who's at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation? No. Distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? No. Peril? No. We live in perilous times. Sword? No. As it is written, now he's quoting the, the psalmist here over in uh, Psalm 44. It says, uh, for all the day long, we are, for, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long and are counted as sheep for the slaughter. No. He says, no. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Did you get that? You're not just conquerors. You're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Let me define for you what more than a conqueror is. According to the definition given by R.W. Schembach, if you know who I'm talking about, powerful evangelist. Well, Brother Schembach, I, I knew Brother Schembach. I ministered with him prayed with him under his tent twice. Powerful man of God. And Brother Schembach said, a more than a conqueror. He said, let me give you an illustration. Uh, the uh, heavy champion, uh, heavyweight champion of the world goes in, into a, a boxing match and he defeats his opponent and, or retains his title. And uh, he's declared the winner. Uh, they give him the belt. He is declared heavyweight champion of the world. They give him the check for winning the fight. He goes home. He opens the door. There's his wife. And he, he's the heavyweight champion of the world. He's got the belt and he gives her the check. And he said, she is more than a conqueror. He's the conqueror. But she's more than a conqueror. Why? She didn't fight the fight, but she got the prize. He fought the fight. He is the conqueror. 
But she's more than the conqueror because she got the money, got the check, and she didn't have to fight the fight. Woo, hallelujah. That's us. We didn't have to fight the fight against Satan. We didn't have to die on the cross at Calvary. We didn't shed our blood. <laughs> Jesus did it all. Jesus paid it all, as the song goes. He fought the fight. He won. He defeated principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, wicked spirits. It says that in Colossians. And he is the conqueror. And we are more than conquerors because he defeated Satan. He won the battle. And he gives us the prize. We have received the benefits of what he did. So we are more than conquerors, the scripture says. And it says, uh, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church is indestructible. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, make sure you understand this. We're not, we're not more than conquerors in ourself. In ourself, we're no match for the devil. But in Christ, we are more than conquerors. We have the uh, a right to use his name. We have power of attorney to use the name of Jesus. I'll go back and recall many, many instances where Jeannie and I ministered deliverance to people over the years. And it, it is amazing. I remember one particular man that was brought to our church one night. He'd been taken out of the hospital. The doctors had given up on him, said he's going to die of cancer and and nothing they can do about it. So some of his friends brought him to church. I think this was a Wednesday night. It could have been a Sunday night. Now, this was when we had actually first started in the ministry. We were in a church downtown, inner city, Little Rock. We had rented it from a denomination that had vacated the premise. The building was up for sale. So we rented it, and that's where we started our first church. And so the men came, and they sat him on the front row, and told us after the church service was over why he was there and would we pray for him? I said, of course. So I asked him what was wrong with him. They said, cancer. They said, he's, he's dying. And so like a good little pastor, I just started. I laid my hands on his head and I said, in the name of Jesus. Well, the minute I said the name of Jesus, all of a sudden, now, this was all new to me in, at that time. All of a sudden, the guy falls out on the floor. I mean, he, he was actually thrown out of the seat, out of the pew, onto the floor. And the Holy Spirit was helping me. And the Holy Spirit said, now, that's demon power. He said, you need to cast the demon spirit of cancer and death out of him. Okay. <laughs> so I knelt down beside him. I laid my hand on his chest. He had cancer of the stomach, I think it was. I laid my hand on his chest, and I began to command that demon spirit of death and cancer to come out of his body. And all of a sudden, this man screamed, and out of his mouth came a voice. It wasn't his voice. It was the voice of those demons. And this voice said, no. We're not coming out. We don't have to come out. And we've been in here a long time and we're not coming out. Now, <laughs> right there is where you decide whether you're called to the ministry or not. <laughs> you make a decision whether you're going to get up and say, okay, just hold on, just, okay, and just go home. No, all of a sudden, something happened on the inside of me. It was the power of the Holy Ghost. I jumped on top of the man. I straddled him around the waist and I grabbed him by the throat and I began to say, yes, you do have to come out. And in the power of the name of Jesus, 
I command you to loose this man's body and let him go. All of a sudden, he began to scream and he grabbed his stomach where the cancer was and his hands just began to follow him up to his neck, to his throat. And he let out a huge cry and, and began to cough and to spit up. And he was delivered of those demons. In fact, when he came to himself, he, he said, and I wouldn't let him up until he, he said, Jesus, he said, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. And he got up and sat on the pew. Now that's the power of the name of Jesus. Now this was a, this was a, this was a Christian man, a born again man. I mean, a lot of, a lot of doctrine in denominational churches don't believe a Christian can have a demon. Well, you've got to define whether the demon is, whether the person is possessed or just oppressed, whether the demon is in the flesh or in the mind or whether the demon is in the spirit. Now, a born again Christian, listen to me carefully, a born again Christian who is truly born again, their spirit is born again. They cannot be possessed with a demon spirit because, uh, uh, you know, possession means ownership. And if you're owned by the spirit of Christ, no demon can come in and possess your spirit. But demons can come in and lodge and take up residence in the mind or the body. A lot of sickness and disease and depression and mental health, and mental illness is all a result of uh, demon spirits. Some blindness. Uh, you can read all of this stuff in the scriptures. I talked at length when I pastored for 35 years about seven steps to possession and how demons actually operate and how they work. And you can be free from all this, not because of your power and ability, but because of Jesus's power and ability. And so you can plainly see here, Jesus is letting us know. Now, this is the Apostle Paul writing in Romans, but Jesus is letting us know nothing can separate you from the love of Christ, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. We're talking about the indestructible church. The church is indestructible. The church is not going down the tubes. Uh, the church is going out in a, in a blaze of glory at the rapture of, of the body of Christ. The church is not going to be defeated. The church is not going to be um, uh, depressed, oppressed. The church is the body of Christ. And no weapon formed against the church, the body of Christ, can prosper. I've seen too many times when uh, the Holy Spirit rescues the church, the body of Christ, empowers the body of Christ. So we're going to continue to see uh, this manifestation. And let me, let me just add a little transcript here. Not only is the, uh, the enemy, Satan, not only can he not prevail, triumph, through strength and superiority. Not only can he tri not triumph over the church, but the church is protected from the wrath of God. There are a lot of people that think that, the, that we're under the wrath of God now, but the Bible says no. Go over to 1 Thessalonians. And let's look at chapter 5, verse 1. The times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, uh, and let me turn my page here. And he goes on, says, for yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, travail upon a woman with a child. They'll not escape. But you, brethren, notice he's talking to, to, to brethren, the church company. Uh, there are going to be a lot of things going to happen to Israel, the nation of Israel and the Jewish people because of their rejection of Messiah and rebellion, they're going to suffer the first three and a half years uh, or, or the second three and a half years of the Great Tribulation period. But, he, but Paul says to the church at Thessalonica, he says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. You are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch 
and be sober. For they that sleep in the night and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and ailment, hope of salvation. For God, this is verse uh, 9, for God has not appointed us to wrath. The church company is not appointed to wrath. The church company is not going to be judged by God for any reason. The, the, the body of Christ, the church company, those that are born again, are not going to suffer the wrath of God. They're not going to be charged with any wrath. We have not been appointed unto wrath. We're the body of Christ. Now, you have to know the whole scripture because it says over in Romans, if you get lifted up in pride, <laughs> he reminds us that he, he took Israel uh, out of the promise and they went through the uh, wilderness and so forth. He said, I can do that for you too if you continue to rebel against me. But he's not talking about rebellion. He's talking about those that have not been appointed to wrath. That's the church company. The church company is indestructible. We're not going to be the only judgment. Now listen to this. Get it right. The only judgment from God that the church company, the body of Christ, is going to get is the judgment seat of Christ, which is a judgment of works, what you have done in the body. Now, don't misunderstand me. You're not going to get to heaven by works. You don't get in the church by works. You become part of the church by revelation of who Jesus is. When you understand who Jesus is, he's the Christ, the son of the living God, and you accept what he did on Calvary for you, you become born again, member of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you're not going to have to suffer the wrath of God. You're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. The only judgment the church is going to receive is the judgment seat of Christ. And that is a judgment of rewards. It's where you are rewarded for what you did in Christ's body. And if you study this out, it plainly says you will be rewarded, you will, you will have rewards, or you will suffer loss of rewards. But no judgment, not the wrath of God. It says here we are not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And then he goes on and says to comfort one another with this, edify each other with this. This is something to be comforted by. <clears throat> You're not going to be appointed to wrath. You're not going to suffer the wrath of God. You're, you're not appointed to, to this. The only judgment you're going to see is the judgment seat of Christ, which is where you're going to be rewarded for what you did in the body, whether it was good or whether it was bad. You will either have rewards or loss of rewards. Somebody made a scale one time just to show you what this looks like, and they started out with 100 points. And if you, you know, passed all these markers and you got reward for this and loss of reward for this, and at the end of the judgment seat of Christ where you got rewarded or loss of, lost rewards because of what you did, whether it was good or bad, in the body of Christ as a believer, not as a sinner, then out of 100 points to start with, that's the maximum. You might come out with 50, 40, 30, 25, <laughs> and it was to kind of wake you up to the fact that, hey, you're gonna, you, it's possible to lose some rewards. If you were a thorn in the pastor's side, if you were full of strife and envy, if you caused contention in the church, if you were divisive, uh, if you lied about things, if you deceived, then you're going to suffer loss of rewards. Oh, you, the Bible says you'll be in heaven but you're not going to have any rewards because what you did was bad. It was not good. So you'll have loss, a subtraction of rewards. But you're not going to, <laughs> this is good news, you're not going to receive the wrath of God. Okay, 
Uh, let's go to the next point that Jesus made uh, when he told Peter, he said, uh, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's the next thing we want to talk about. He says, I'm going to give the church the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 16, 19. What does that mean? I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about keys to unlock the door to get you into heaven. The door's not locked. There's, he's not talking about physical keys. I'm going to give you the word keys symbolizes authority. I'm going to give you the authority and the power. Here, here's, here's how you would paraphrase that. I'm going to give, I'm going to hand over to you, the church company, the body of Christ, believers. I'm going to hand over to you the authority of the church. Uh, I'm going to give you the keys, the authority. I'm handing over to you the authority in the church to bind and to loose. Now, we'll deal with that tomorrow or the next day. I'm going to give you authority. I'm going to turn over to you the authority uh, for the church to bind and loose on the earth. Now, uh, this, this word, um, keys of the kingdom of heaven, actually one translation says these are the keys from the kingdom of heaven. These are the keys from the kingdom of heaven. In other words, this is the way heaven operates. The keys of the kingdom represent the system by which heaven operates. Now, I'm going to say that again. If you're writing notes, write it down. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to give you the operating system. I recently had to uh, repair, uh, replace uh, air conditioning units at my house, and I, at the same time, got a new generator for power outages. And the installers gave me a big packet of books, manuals, and it was to understand how the systems operated. That's what Jesus said. I'm going to give you the keys. Uh, join me tomorrow. I'm going to continue with this. And remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you live too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221 or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at vtntv.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at vtntv.com.